morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where on earth you're joining us today for our first ever Earth 300 Impact Talks. This is going to be our first episode, and today we're going to focus on a very special theme dealing with multidisciplinary initiatives and their impact on sustainability and climate change today. We have lined up 21 amazing speakers from you coming from all over the world who will be giving their three minutes intervention before I will ask my colleague Sarah Baikum, also from London, to give them targeted questions collected from our audiences. After that, I will be asking our founder and CEO of Earth 300, Alon Oruvera, who will give us a historical approach of where we are going in the next decade and what Earth 300 is all about. I'm very delighted to also share that Earth 300, Worldview Impact Foundation and Earth Bank are going to be working together with local communities in the Sundarbans of India to plant 300,000 trees this year with local partners, local donors and local corporates in India to restore the forests of the tide, hence creating a natural defense shield for communities living by the sea in the most high risk zones of the world from climate-induced storms and hurricanes and tsunamis and floods, thereby protecting livelihoods of the very poor and the most vulnerable in that part of India and Bangladesh, and also protecting the habitat of the Royal Bengal Tiger. We know there are only 3,500 tigers left in the wild, but 300 of them have adapted to the swamps, and they are called the swamp tigers. So I'm very honored to say that we are joining forces with Earth 300 and other partners to restore this very precious ecosystem, which is the largest mangrove forest on our planet. Having said that, I want to thank all our speakers who have contributed their time, their energies, their expertise, and he, they will be sharing their experiences, but also their challenges and their battle against climate change and addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by a target date of 2030. Having said that, again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board to our first episode, and I'm gonna give the floor to Aaron Oliveira. Thank you so much, and have a great conversation. Hello, friends, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the first installment of our Earth 300 Impact Talks. The kind of conversations we'll be having here today online are the kind of conversations that eventually we will be having about a 300 meter state-of-the-art exploration, innovation and scientific vessel on its way to Antarctica. Earth 300 was born out of a need to protect our planet, but really more accurately and more truthfully it was born out of a need to protect ourselves. Antonio Gutierrez, the United Nations Chief, recently stated that we're standing on the verge of climate abyss with extreme heat poised to cause more death, more destruction, and more displacement than all of the wars of history combined, the picture is not pretty. We need change, the monumental kind. We need to inspire an era of ecological imagining. We need to galvanize humanity to take big, bold leaps. We need everybody's help, and that's where multidisciplinarity comes in. Now, Leonardo da Vinci said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, but really nothing is that simple. In a single atom lies a complex labyrinth of structures and codes that drive and organize the entire universe. When an atom shakes, the whole universe vibrates. So really nothing is independent. Carl Sagan, the famous planetary scientist and cosmologist, uh, equipped that if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So multidisciplinarity is into everything that we do. And today you'll hear from an esteemed panel of experts and leaders in their fields of why they believe that holistic thinking and, and multidisciplinarity is essential in order for us to build a truly sustainable world. Um, now at Earth 300, this is the ethos that we believe in and we've been able and privileged to attract an incredible a talented pool of individuals, uh, so I'd like to thank our, our team who formed the DNA of our organization, our advisors who are spread all over the world and whose expert insights and faith have allowed us to get this far, our partners who have allowed us to technologically progress in terms of the project and, and, the, and the ship. Uh, design and, and all of the technical elements to it, the media which has been incredibly supportive. We've had articles in over 50 countries, um, the, the, the global population who have, has reached out to us um, and whose enthusiasm fuels us for the journey. 
Um, and finally, I'd like to also thank Sarah, Sarah huh? Begum, who will be moderating this panel, Bremley Is Lindo, who's chairing the, 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 uh, the session, and also Wakas Ahmed, who's our chief interdisciplinary officer, and he will talk about, we need, about how we need to move from multidisciplinarity to interdisciplinarity, which means that not only do different perspectives need to coexist, multi at the same time, but also we need to make new creations and new connections and pathways with those different disciplines coming together. As Steve Jobs said, creativity is simply connecting the dots. So I hope that these talks will inspire you to connect your own dots and we hope to, to continue to see you in the future and um, please join us for, for the talks and for the quest. Thank you. Hello and welcome from London, where I am live for the Earth 300 Impact Talks. I'm so excited to be moderating this panel with influential minds around the planet. Hello, my name is Martin Kemp. I'm an Emeritus Professor of the History of Art at University of Oxford and have spent a good deal of time looking at Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he's obviously admirable in all this range of things he does, painting, architecture, sculpture, anatomy, physics, geology, etc, etc. There's hardly any range of the human sciences which he didn't touch on productively to some extent. So he's obviously a remarkable figure. Uh, known as a polymath. Um, I've coined a word and said he's really actually a monomath. That's to say he sees all these diverse areas which we separate out into discrete disciplines all with their own jargons, their own ways of proceeding. Um, he, separate, he doesn't separate these out, he sees them as a single unified field, a field of the knowledge of human beings, the knowledge of nature, and these are the same areas of knowledge. They're not essentially separate categories of knowledge. Uh, so we can look at Leonardo for joined up thinking which we absolutely need at this present moment in this time of notable crisis. Um, he teaches us to look at things in a more unified way which we're still not good at doing and this lack of joined up thinking is pretty catastrophic for the future of the earth and the future of human beings on it. So he's very relevant to Earth 300 if we look in more specific terms and look at one area of his activity, that is to say his geology and his studies in the body of the earth, he has a notion of the human body as a, as a lesser world, he calls it a small miniature world that inside us all the processes of nature which we can see outside are represented on a smaller scale. This is Classically, information research, the notion of the microcosm, uh, microcosm on a smaller scale. The human body this is a model for the larger world outside, and this is a fuel for terrifically energetic and remarkably innovative research for how we can work with nature. Uh, I've been looking at this very closely recently with the Codex Lester, so called, owned by Bill Gates. Um, that very extraordinary uh, compilation of what we can do with water, how we can work with water, and it, he says he, it won't be pushed around in order to be a good engineer of watery things. We have to work with nature itself and with how nature, uh, nature works. So this is an absolutely fundamental lesson which we need to take on board, that we can't say we are masters of nature, that clearly isn't the case, and the notion of the lesser world and the greater world and the integration of these two works absolutely amazingly if we set it in our present context. 
Dear citizens of planet Earth, it gives me great pleasure as the director of the Earth Observatory of Singapore at Nanyang Technological University to say a few words about the Earth 300 impact talks. This is an important event for the future of climate science in Singapore and beyond. There has never been a more important time to be an Earth scientist. As the director of the Earth Observatory, I have on many occasions spoken about the existential threat of climate change and sustainability. I have spoken to fellow academics, from chairs to deans, from provosts to presidents, both at home and abroad. I have spoken to government officials, to industry, to businesses, to schools. After explaining the facts, the driving processes, climate projections, and that we are approaching a tipping point beyond which there is no return, I am always asked about the hope for the future. I believe that of all the challenges that we face, climate change is the one that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any others. I believe that there is something of being too late. When it comes to climate change and sustainability, the hour is upon us. But armed with the education of how the Earth works, if we act boldly and swiftly, if we set aside our political interests in the favour of the air that the young people will breathe, the food that they will eat, and the water that they will drink, if we think about them and their hopes and their dreams, if we act boldly, it won't be too late. Only then can we leave a world behind that is worthy of our children, where there is reduced conflict and greater cooperation. A world marked not by human suffering, but by human progress. Consider the role of Earth 300 a catalyst to inspire an era of climate and environmental innovation. The concept of Earth 300 reminds me of the mission to put a man on the moon. When President John F. Kennedy said, we chose to go to the moon in 1962, he wanted it done by the end of the decade. At that time, much of the expertise and machinery that would allow humans to walk on the moon did not exist. We are all living together on a single planet, which is threatened by our own actions. Every person, every community, every country must respond to the existential threat of climate change, as if our lives depended upon it, because they do. Over to you. My name is Richard Dunn and I am CEO of The Harmony Project. The Harmony Project's main purpose is to transform education to a much more interdisciplinary, integrated approach to learning. The Harmony Project's inspiration has come from a book written by the Prince of Wales entitled Harmony, in which he explores how our connection to nature and its universal eternal laws and principles can help us to learn to live in a more sustainable way. So the Harmony Project is looking to see how these principles, principles of interdependence, cycles, diversity, adaptation and health can inform a new way of learning. This work was developed in a state primary school where I was head teacher and now we're sharing this work widely across schools and other education settings, both in the UK and around the world. And our hope is that through this much more interdisciplinary, integrated approach, children will be better able and equipped to make sense of the world and their place in it. So through the Earth 300 event, I hope to be able to explain how these principles work, why they are so important to us at this time in terms of a sustainable future, and how we can help our young people to develop an understanding of these principles so that they can live a healthy, sustainable life 
in a healthy, sustainable world. It is, in effect, a philosophy for life. So I look forward to seeing you at the session at Earth 300 soon. Thank you. Dear all, welcome to the EHL campus in Singapore. 128 years young, EHL has now grown into the leading global hospitality and service management education provider. We are thrilled to have been able to open our campus in Singapore, and we are proud to participate in Earth 300's initiative and hosting today's event. Being a global leader comes with responsibility. Due to their nature, the hospitality and service industries have a significant impact on our environment. Carbon emissions resulting from travels, also reduced during the COVID-19 crisis, remain a cause of concern, which is being addressed worldwide. As an education institution, it is our responsibility to ensure the highest standards for ourselves, since, by so doing, we contribute to setting them for the industries that we serve. Indeed, it is our duty to prepare our future leaders to be mindful and conscious of the impact of the actions they take on a daily basis. Sustainability is part of EHS DNA. Our faculty integrates this key subject in the courses they teach and the research they conduct, where we aim at dedicating 25% of the projects to sustainability topics. In our curriculum, the best example is our preparatory year, during which students are exposed to concrete sustainability methods throughout the value chain. In addition, during the bachelor years, they will be taught courses in corporate sustainability or business ethics, for example. Last but not least, a series of dedicated short courses will be launched on a Singapore campus as of 2022. This is great, but we want to contribute beyond education, which is why sustainability is a central component of our students' experience on and off our campuses. Sustainability is not a standalone notion. On the contrary, it has to be integrated in multidisciplinary programs in all possible areas and functions of EHL Education Group, which is why our approach is holistic. EHL Group's sustainability strategy is based on the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and encompasses four main areas, education, communities, people, and environment. Most of all, we create opportunities for students to contribute to our bold objectives by putting into place cross-fertilization processes between them, our faculty, and our startups, by exposing them to a new pedagogical garden where they can learn about the importance of growing and using local food systems, and by involving them in students' business projects to support not-for-profit organizations, sustainability, and diversity. But we don't want to stop there. The environment and climate challenges we face are not debatable. We have no other choice than walk the talk and implement concrete and bold actions to reduce our own impact as a group so that sustainability becomes self-evident to ourselves and our students' mindsets. And for that, we commit to reporting progress with the utmost transparency and be held accountable for the achievement of these commitments. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. The great polymath and astronaut F. Story Musgrave once said that nature draws curves, only man draws lines. You see, this is a very important point to understand if we're going to shed a new light on our planetary crisis, if we're going to learn how to tackle and even solve the climate crisis. It's an issue that is uh, on the minds of academics and professional experts. We know that there is an increasing amount of awareness and consciousness about our planetary condition. We know that academics and professionals are in their own unique ways making useful contributions, are trying to understand the problem better. We, as individuals, are trying to do more to help ourselves help the planet, our home. The problem lies in the fact that these silos that we have built within academia, within the professional world, within government and politics, within the commercial space, have really served to reinforce a lack of understanding about climate change. Why is that? Because when we silo off each area of knowledge or each area of expertise, 
we do that to our detriment. We do that to the detriment of a fuller understanding of a complex problem. You see, a complex problem requires systems thinking, a kind of thinking that appreciates and acknowledges the interconnectedness of these different facets. Of course, uh, the climate crisis is a systems problem. Our planet is a system. There are many moving parts, each relying on one another, each affecting one another, many of which are unpredictable, are non-linear. So in order to make significant breakthroughs in each of these, in order to make significant breakthroughs so that we might attain or achieve the uh, UN sustainability goals, the important thing is for us to work together collaboratively in a manner that fosters creativity, fosters open-mindedness, fosters a greater understanding of one another's disciplines, one another's areas of expertise, and also trying to look at the whole problem more holistically, in a more rounded way, in a way that where government and politics understand science better, where science understands the arts better, where academia understands business better, and vice versa. If we were to do this in a manner that is open and uh, in a manner that's more sincere, we would achieve great things. And this is why Earth 300 is such an important organization. It's an organization that fosters this kind of systems thinking, this kind of multidisciplinarity, and it understands fully that, these, that the answer or the solution to this complex planetary challenge that we have is one that requires us all to come together, all to come together to work in harmony, with mutual respect, with a common purpose. This is something lacking today, which is why I fully welcome the Earth 300 project and which is why I feel proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Ash Brockwell. I'm an associate professor at the London Interdisciplinary School, uh, working on ecology, some social science methods, uh, some ethnobiology, a uh, little bit of chemistry, and various other bits and pieces. So interdisciplinarity is really crucial um, when you're talking about sustainability. And ecological systems have always been complex, and the interrelated ecological emergencies that we're facing as a global community are even more complex. They're wicked problems in the sense that they're constantly evolving. There's no right answer. Everything is non-linear and a small change over here can make a huge difference over there. Uh, so in that sense, multidisciplinary work or beyond that interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work is more or less a given. Uh, because to imagine that any of these issues can be tackled by just ecologists or just anthropologists or even just artists would be like trying to cook a four course meal when you've only got one ingredient. My word of the year is mind shifts, which my spell checker doesn't like. It keeps underlining it in red and trying to tell me I mean mindsets. Neuroscience tells us that lifelong learning is a biological reality, that neuroplasticity doesn't stop when you get to a certain age, that the human brain is constantly rewiring itself, and not just in response to physical injury, but mental events too. So no, I don't mean mindsets, because people don't change their thinking by clicking from one fixed state to another. It's a continuous process of adaptation and shifting and making new connections. So there's a mind shift going on in Western education that's been going on for decades now, but it's increasingly picking up speed. And that's the recognition of how interconnected everything is and how much damage we're doing by trying to break life down into subjects and disciplines and treat them as if they were all unrelated. Of course, indigenous communities around the world have always known about the interconnectedness of everything. And that awareness has always been woven through everything not just their education, but their spirituality, their food production, their health care, their oral literature, even what we might refer to now as their conservation practices. You can't draw a line around any one of those things and separate it out from all the others. And because of the centuries of colonial oppression that made a lot of those practices illegal, and all the intergenerational trauma that came with it, and more recently cultural appropriation and new age romanticism, it's a really sensitive area where we as white people need to tread carefully. We don't want to be those white guys clambering all over the sacred rock without permission and making everything worse. But it's about respect, it's about listening, it's about finding the principles that underpin indigenous ways of knowing and being, and then working out how we can apply those principles in new contexts through partnerships and networks. 
I've recently been reading Sand Talk by the Aboriginal author Tyson Yunker Porter. And what he gives us is exactly that, not the what, but the how of Indigenous knowledges. It's about mind shifts, not just from separation to interconnectedness, but also from monocultures to diversity, from the individual to the collective, and from taking a static view to thinking about complex dynamic systems and how they're adapting. It's fascinating and it's crucial for human survival. And so in my talk, I'll be sharing some ideas around these mind shifts and the insights that we can gain about them from different disciplines. Well, thank you so much to all our esteemed uh, panelists from the first round who, in, uh, who were thinkers and theorists. And I'd also like to welcome everybody watching us on our YouTube channel live from all over the world. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Please uh, tune in and post your questions on our YouTube channel, and we will take your questions and pose it to our speakers. On that note, I'd like to hand over the mic to Sarah Begum who will be taking questions right now for our first panelists. Thank you so much. Please stay tuned. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Bramley. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we've had an amazing list of speakers for the first round. And today, I'm going to begin with Sandra Pinchik, who is an architect and many other things, actually. And she's going to be enlightening us about how her work has shaped sustainability and climate and um, many other things. So, uh, connecting the dots out of sequence can often lead to new ways of approaching challenges. Sandra, what role does serendipity play in the scientific process? <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, thank you to, to have me. Do I understand the question correctly? Could you kindly say it again? Yeah, sure. Connecting the dots out of sequence can often lead to new ways of approaching challenges. So what role does serendipity play in the scientific process? Mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, the question is uh, of capacity to innovate. So um, a, an experiment, quite often innovation comes from bringing unexpected uh, um, people, unexpected disciplines together to come up with some new solutions. And we see that more and more, uh, even within the climate change movement in particular, or within regional uh, work on, in places like Europe, where organizations and people come together to um, bring the unexpected mix of disciplines, people to come up with new solutions for a more sustainable world. And that also requires res response to the science itself, yeah. Amazing. So are there examples from Southeast Asia when old and new ideas have been combined to come up with innovative, sustainable solutions? Um, I'm particularly uh, based, I'm based in Europe right now, <laughs> although I had the privilege to, to do a global review uh, of vernacular architecture and obviously Southeast Asia um, is a brilliant example. I think that um, perhaps some experiments uh, in the urban scale of what has been happening where people are trying to mix all the new are very interesting. I think that Asia in particular has a very strong cultural context and context of identity, which is hugely important. So uh, despite the globalization, there, there is an as the cultural aspect is quite strong uh, in terms of visual and cultural identity and, and well done for holding to it. And I think that the transition that is happening in Asia also right now in terms of uh, traditional and old and the use of technology is quite promising and perhaps the rest of the world can follow the suit. And I'm going to start asking my questions to Ben Morton. Ben, hello. Welcome to our Impact Talks. Oh, you're muted, Ben. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, Ben, as an earth scientist, I'm too late to overcome the climate crisis. What do you believe are the most crucial three steps that humanity must take to avert the impending cataclysm? Well, that's a big question. It is. Um, but I think if you look at the events that have happened over the last couple of weeks, you can quite clearly see we're in a climate emergency. You can think about the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest, uh, a region of the planet that if you've ever visited is dominated by moderately cool temperatures but they had temperatures of 50 degrees C 
people lost their lives. It's estimated that over a million marine life became extinct. And this week, we have the devastating floods in Germany. So we've entered a period where climate emergency is upon us, and therefore we need to act. I think it's the responsibility of every individual, every government and every country to address the climate emergency. And it all starts with education. If you're informed about the problem, you're more likely to understand and react to it. And that's why I'm very proud to be a professor in a world-class university of NTU, where I teach earth scientists, engineers, artists, finance, medical. I teach them about the how the earth works, because if you understand how the earth works, you can repair it. And the third thing I'd just like to finish with is mm -hmm. that we're in the midst of this pandemic. The solution to the pandemic is a vaccine. There is no vaccine for climate change. And I'll give you an example. If our, temperatures, example. <laughs> if our temperatures go above two degrees C above pre-industrial, the Antarctic ice sheet collapses. The Antarctic ice sheet has enough water within it to raise global sea level 65 meters. 65 meters. Do you know how long it takes to regrow an ice sheet? A hundred thousand years. Wow. There's no vaccine. We need to act, and we need well, to be Sebastian to explore if the, uh, if the polar ice sheets melt and they just vanish from our planet. I'm just going to go to Workhouse now. Thank you so much for that, Ben. That's uh, really interesting. Workhouse, Yogi Berra said, in theory, uh, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So how easy is it to turn interdisciplinary thinking from theoretical to the practical? given the myriad obstacles that exist. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all the other panelists for joining me in this conversation. Um, <clears throat> this is an important question. I think this is a false dichotomy, the thinker-doer or the thinker-practitioner dichotomy that we've created, that some people are thinkers, and I know we've done this for this particular event, but that's for a particular purpose. I think we all need to think and we all need to act. I think um, as, uh, as um, uh, Ben very, very accurately and very correctly mentioned, we all need to educate ourselves. We all need to contemplate what's actually happening, understand the world from different perspectives, understand the impact that human activities have having on nature in general, on the planet, understand the different mechanisms that are at play understand where we might contribute as individuals, as societies, as organizations. And so when we have that kind of big picture perspective, which only comes from thinking and from understanding, then we can understand where our actions will bear most fruit, where um, our contributions will be most appropriate. So I think uh, moving from theory to practice uh, is a process, a process that involves education, which we as individuals need to take charge of. But of course, we also need to reform dramatically the education system towards this direction. And then once we've, once we've actually, once we've actually uh, educated ourselves, we can then identify those projects, uh, those campaigns, those ideas, organizations that we need to get involved in to have maximum impact and then utilize our skills and knowledge towards that purpose. Amazing, thank you so much for that, Marcus. Um, going back to Ben, so Ben, I want to know how is academia helping to prepare today's students and tomorrow, tomorrow's leaders to become polymaths? Are there any successful examples? I think there are every single day examples of how academics have educated students to understand the earth. I, in my, my previous job, I was chair of the Asian School of the Environment. That was the first school in Singapore to educate students on earth system sciences and sustainability. So we, for the first time, put educated students into the workplace in Singapore that understood how the earth worked, 
understood how you needed to value nature and were better able to protect the world. So that's a huge success story. When I worked at the University of Pennsylvania, which is very famous for the Wharton Business School, I went to Wharton and I said to Wharton that for all of their MBAs, they need to be taught about how the climate works because you've got the next movers and shakers in the world coming out of Wharton and they need to understand climate change. And I think that's the key. I hope that every single student here in Singapore takes a course on climate change and sustainability. It goes back to my previous question. It's all about education. Not just in Singapore, I don't think it should be limited. I think, I think it needs to be adopted by curriculums around the world. Do you not agree? Very much so. Very yeah. much so. And so I think that that is a mandate regarding education. Mm -hmm. Every single student gets taught a language or gets taught math, gets taught a science. Why isn't every single student taught sustainability? Okay. Um, well, that's something that we need to address, and that's why we're here. And then hopefully you can do something about it then. <laughs> um, I'm trying. So, yeah, I know you're trying. It's amazing. Keep trying. <laughs> So I'm going to ask one last question to whack us before we play the next set of videos for artists uh, and activists. So this is relatable to Earth 300. This Earth 300 is a multidisciplinary global environmental initiative. What are the individual disciplines that are most critical to Earth 300's success? And more specifically, how can they be woven together for effective, actionable output? Thank you. The, the answer to that is that uh, I cannot identify specific disciplines that are key to Earth 300 success. That would be uh, defeating the notion of interdisciplinarity um, in, or multidisciplinarity. We need to um, look at this as a problem, right? So we need to say, okay, this is a problem. Let's forget disciplines for a second. This is a problem that requires urgent attention. Now, what are the areas of knowledge that we need in order to address and tackle this problem? These areas of knowledge are not necessarily mapped well onto uh, degree programs or disciplines at schools and universities. They may come from a variety of so-called disciplines and subjects. So when you think outside of the disciplinary box and think more in systems, think that this is a problem that is a systems problem and requires a systemic response. So we need to understand at what stages of that system, what components and mechanisms require different forms of knowledge in order to shed light on it. And that's why Earth 300 is very important because both in terms, both in, t in trying to understand the problem and then going on to try and tackle or solve it, um, it, it it's inherently um, going to be taken a interdisciplinary or a systems approach to that. So it's not a simple case of, uh, of, of looking at the earth sciences, for example, which are vast, um, or looking at molecular biology or geology or marine science or those typical subjects that are often associated with climate change and the environment. Um, we're looking at a variety of other areas. As Ben said, he's been educating medics and artists and activists and so on. Everybody has, and every nugget of knowledge or every individual from different fields has an important role to play in this systemic, systemic problem. And so that is uh, what's so very exciting about Earth 300, in that it's seeking to bring these perspectives together but also synthesize them and draw out connections to bring about unique insights as well as innovation. Amazing, thank you so much, Wakas. Thank you. Wakas, thank you so much. And Ben and Sandra, thank you, Sarah, for those thoughtful working questions. We've just heard from our theorists and thinkers, ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned. We're gonna to move to the next round where we will hear from our artists and activists, and then you keep asking questions, and then we will have a third round at the very end, when we then finally sum it up. So please stay tuned and keep your questions flowing through the YouTube channel. Over to you.